This podcast contains adult language and stories of true crime. If you don't like laughing, crying, or being horrified at the actions of other humans, this podcast is not for you. Hello, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 4 of Resolve Mysteries. Hi. Hello. Oh, was that a meow? Hello is is what oh. it came out as. It's not what I meant it for it to sound like. And then I thought <laughs> you'd just skip over it, but... No, I had to inquire. <laughs> <laughs> this is the show where we re-watch, recap, and give you the latest updates to cases featured on the show, Unsolved Mysteries. I'm Carlin. I'm Allison. I'm Eliza. <laughs> We're recording a little bit later than we usually do. It's, it's only 6.20, but it is 80 degrees in my home, so I do feel like I'll fall asleep at any moment. So welcome to our show. For every review we receive, we donate a dollar to a different organization, and for this month, that organization is Life After Hate, which was recommended by patron Allison H. And speaking of our patrons, you guys, we have some patrons to shout out. Yes. Thank you to Sarah G, Amelia D, James H, Lisa M, Muggleborn Wizard, Hermione, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> Emily A, Vilma T, and Justin W. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So if you'd like to support us on Patreon, you would get access to ad-free episodes, two additional episodes a month early access to listener short stacks, and goodies in the mail. Go to patreon.com slash Resolve Mysteries podcast. And we just want to give you guys a little heads up and reminder that we will be having a summer hiatus. Yeah, we will. Where we will not be talking to you for a little while. We're not <laughs> mad at you. We will come back. Just hang on a quick break. Mm-hmm. break. And that is from July 26th to August 25th. Lucky, lucky patrons will still get short stacks and some extra content. So you guys will still have an episode every week for the break. Yay. Yeah. Uh, what are we covering this episode, everyone? This is going to be a little bit of a different episode. We're going to do the first segment as a standalone because of its length. And I am covering it. It is an investigator's segment, and it is the story of the Connecticut River Killer or the Connecticut River Valley Killers. Okay, and then next week, but still part of episode four, I have the wanted segment of Judge John Fairbanks. And then we have the lost loves of Paul and Paula Scribner and their sister Sue. All right. Oh, let's do it, y'all. You ready? Let's do it. Okay, so the first segment of season four, episode four, is about the Connecticut River Valley Killer. Okay. And it is deep, and it is long, and here we go. Here we go. (laughs) Girthy? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's beefy. Claremont, New Hampshire, May 1984, 17-year-old Bernice Cordemanche sets off for her boyfriend's house, and she is never heard from again. The segment escalates very quickly when next we see John Philippin, a psychologist, and he tells us that this particular killer does a lot of driving. Oh, boy. I didn't know that she was murdered, but I guess now we know. We now we know. Mm -hmm. So that mystery is solved. He says that the killer is selecting sites that are low risk for him. Stack says two months after Bernice Countermunch went missing, 27-year-old Ellen Fried, a registered nurse also from Claremont, New Hampshire, called her sister from a payphone. She, too, is never heard from again. They show a reenactment of a woman at a phone booth, and she tells the person that she's speaking to to hold on for a minute because there is a guy that keeps driving back and forth and making her nervous. She says she wants to see if she can get the car started. In the reenactment, she puts down the phone and then walks away. John Philippin says that he doesn't think that the women were pre-selected as victims. Philippin says that the killer selects sites and goes from site to site. Stack says 18 months later, the skeletal remains of Ellen Fried were found in an isolated area eight miles outside of Claremont, New Hampshire. 
Bernice Contramanche's decomposed body would turn up in the same woods one mile away. And just a year later, the body of another young woman, Barbara Agnew, was found on an isolated hillside in Heartland, Vermont. Stack tells us that police estimate that there may be as many as 100 serial killers living amongst us on our streets and in our neighborhoods. He says they are cool and calculating, choosing victims indiscriminately with little or no remorse for their actions. The overwhelming task for authorities is to determine how the serial killer thinks and hopefully learn where and when he might strike again. One such investigation is currently underway in New England. Eliza, what were you saying about six active serial killers in a city or something? What were you saying? Oh, I was listening to a podcast where that is the thought. Like, there are six active serial killers in a big city like New York or Chicago at any given time. But then they were talking about could serial killers, by metric standards, include, like, I mean, I hate to say this but like gang members or something like that's just what they were saying because it's two or more at a different time right or are they really defining it as like serial killer planning a lone person sort of thing yeah huh that is interesting because it's only two it only takes your number to get to two and then you're a serial killer so two or more two or more so I think yeah. it is probably more than we think, which is scary. Oh, I was going to say six seems like a lot, but I guess, I don't know, I guess in a huge city like that. Right. Wow. Ugh. So that would make the number more than 100, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Yikes. You would think that there would be less with... Yes. Over time, right? Yeah. but Just because of the sheer risk of being caught is so much higher now. Right. Especially in a major city, there are cameras everywhere, but I guess if you're killing either an underserved population like sex workers or you're killing people that you have no connection to it's a lot harder to get caught yeah yeah thank you i was i was wondering about that yeah stack says the bodies of seven young women have been discovered within a 50 mile radius along the new hampshire vermont border Police believe that six of the seven women were abducted and taken into remote wooded areas where they were murdered. All of the victims suffered from similar stab wounds, and police began to suspect that the killings were the work of the same individual. Mm. With no witnesses and little physical evidence, investigators were at a standstill. As a last resort, New Hampshire State Police brought in criminal psychologist John Philippin to develop a profile of the killer. As a last resort, I think that speaks to how much they respect a, a criminal psychologist. I know. Or, like, or it's a profiler. shifted so much. Ah, the psychic didn't work. Bring in the criminal profiler. <laughs> Truly. Yes. So I read a book called The Shadow of Death by Philip Ginsburg about Connecticut River Valley Killer. And a lot of it was about John Philippin. And his approach to profiling and his work on this case and some other cases. Philippin says that his approach is to gather as much of the same information that police use. So he uses police reports and crime scene photos, autopsy reports, photographs. Every bit of information that would be available to the investigators is what he would begin with. Detective Sergeant Clay Young of the New Hampshire State Police says that a profile isn't going to tell you who the individual is, but... It can give you the type of individual that you're looking for. And if you have a suspect, it can tell you if you have the right avenue or if you're taking the right approach. I guess this is probably one of the first times that America at Large on network television had even really heard of a profiler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of dumbfounded as to why we were talking so much about it. I guess it's just part of our pop culture now, but this was probably a new big thing to be talking about. Yeah, totally. Philippin says that he made several trips out to the locations where Bernice and Ellen were killed to get a feel for the crime. He says that when he gets to the point where he is beginning to develop a feel for what is going on in the mind of the killer, he will go back to the scenes and using what he has learned, he will go through what happened as if he were the killer. Mm. Philippin says that part of what goes on with this killer is that he has a very strong need to take the women away alive, transport them to the site that he has pre-selected, and at that point he can do what he he wishes. So that goes back to him saying it's, it's not about the victims, but it's about bringing them to the pre-selected location. Mm-hmm. And you know, when I was thinking about when he said he picks locations, mm-hmm. it's like how many women did he drive by in the location he wanted but 
they just he didn't take them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's so scary that yeah. it's not a specific yeah. person he's after. It's very um, it, place based and like circumstantial sort of. Mm-hmm. Opportunistic. Bundy yeah. comes to mind very much with that because mm-hmm. same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Midnight, August 8th, 1988 in Winchester, New Hampshire, a 23-year-old woman named Jane was on her way home from a county fair when she stopped for a soda. Jane was seven months pregnant. As she's sitting in her car drinking her soda, a man comes up to the door and tries to pull her out. Mm. She kicks and screams, and then he pulls a knife on her and gets her out of the car. In the reenactment, the man says, quote, you hurt my girlfriend real bad. Oh, yeah. And she says, no, I didn't. What are you talking about? And he says, those are Massachusetts plates, right? And she says, no, New Hampshire. And then tries to run away. Stack says that the man's plans to abduct Jane had gone awry. Jane is interviewed, and she says that the man got to his vehicle, and she had rolled over onto her stomach and was starting to get up on her hands and knees. Mm. She says the man drove by, looked at her, and just kept driving. So they don't really get into what he did to her in that reenactment. Yeah. It sort of jumps to her describing him driving past her, and she says that the whole time he was dealing with her, he was really calm, and he wasn't upset, and that was terrifying. And then they show this reenactment, and Jane says that she could feel the blood rushing out of her, and that Mm. she thought she was going to die. Ugh, and she's pregnant. Oh. Yeah. She's very pregnant. Yeah, even when she said rolled over on her stomach, it's like, you can't do that when you're pregnant. (laughs) Not when you're seven and a half months pregnant. Oh my god. I thought it was interesting too. Usually when you hear survivors, they talk about how in their heads, how they were going to survive. You know, I got to get out of here. I got to do this. And I read in the book, The Shadow of Death, they interview her and it's more extensive. And not only did she say, I'm going to die, but she kept saying it out loud mm. to herself the entire time, mm. which I think is really interesting because as she's telling herself she's going to die, she's doing all of the things to, to not survive. Die. Oh my yeah. God, weird. So she says that she felt like she had to go to her friend's house to get help. And Stack says that although Jane had been stabbed and slashed a total of 18 times, she somehow managed to crawl back into her car and drive to a friend's house two miles away. So this is super scary. Jane is driving to get to her friend's house. She actually had 19 stab wounds. Mm. She is losing tons and tons of blood. And as she's driving, she pulls up right behind the man who attacked her. Yes. Yes. Oh, my God. Horrible. Mm -hmm. (sighs) So apparently in the book Shadow of Death, Jane says that the man knew – she saw the man look in the rearview mirror and know that it was her. No. Thank goodness her friend only lived two miles away. So she pulled into her friend's driveway. But it's like, so when he has, she's seen his face. Yes. Ugh. Yes. Yeah. It, it's crazy. It's absolutely bananas. Yeah. So she pulls into her friend's driveway and then the attacker drove on. And then up the road, the attacker turned around and came back. He stopped momentarily in front of the house and then drove off. Hmm. Stack says that miraculously, none of the stab wounds hit any vital organs of the fetus. And two months later, Jane gave birth to a healthy baby girl. Amazing. We love it. Yeah. So Jane agreed to undergo hypnosis with John Philippin and was able to describe a graphic eyewitness account of her terrifying ordeal. Philippin says that Jane was able to supply very specific details. Uh, Philippin says that the man... Uh, is very specific, very methodical, and very calm. He doesn't get rattled, and he is very much in control. Mm. Jane says that he was calm and cool throughout the whole attack. He never got mad. He never showed any signs of being nervous. Jane told Philippin that she struggled and fought as much as she could, but at some point she stopped. And when she stopped struggling, the assault stopped. Mm. Ugh. Ugh. I just... Think about how scary that would be to see that person not be worked up at all. Like, you're thinking, yeah. how many times have you done this? How professional yeah. are you at this? Mm-hmm. Like, Yeah, she she talks about that in the book, too. Just oh. He was completely calm. It was it was like she was just, she was freaking out, and he was totally level. So Ugh. scary. So scary. Philippine theorizes that the more she resisted, the more determined he was, and that as soon as her resistance began to wane, the attack ended. 
I was thinking that that happened because he thought that she was right. going to be dead. Right. So oh. I think he probably thought, I've stabbed her enough times. She's going to die eventually. I need to get out of here. Right. And then Jane gives a description of the car and tries to remember the license plate, but she says it's too dirty. Hmm. Detective Sergeant Clay Young says that they worked to identify the Jeep. She knew that it was a Jeep Wagoneer. I did read in the book, she was able to identify three out of the six letters and numbers on the license plate eventually, Mm -hmm. and also was able to identify the registration tag color, which indicated... Oh, yeah, what year? Yeah, what year. Oh, wow. Wow, I I wouldn't have thought about that. They worked to identify the Jeep, and to do that, they enlisted the help of Vermont and Massachusetts, and they printed out a list of all the Jeep Wagoneers in those states that matched the description that Jane had given them. Stack says that police narrowed the search down to 1,350 Jeeps throughout New England. Unfortunately, none of the leads pinpointed a suspect. Even though the investigation stalled again, they did have a composite sketch of the man. Stack says the police do not know who the killer is, but now they know what he looks like and how he thinks. Philippin says that the man is a loner type of person who prefers his own thoughts, his own fantasies. He thinks that the killer thinks of women as arrogant, intrusive types of people. And he says, quote, so that I could see him making an adjustment that might call within the realm of normal, but it would require, I think, a very limited exposure to groups of people. I had no idea what he was saying. (laughs) What is the translation? That's a direct quote. That's what he says. I don't know if it was edited poorly, but it's basically word salad. Hmm. But I think what he's saying is that the killer is able to get along in groups of people for a limited amount of time. Hmm. He can't spend a lot of time because who he is will naturally come out. Yeah. Yeah. His aggression towards women will eventually come out. Jane says that she feels really fortunate to be alive, but she wishes that killer could be found so it wouldn't happen to somebody else Hmm. because maybe they wouldn't be so fortunate. And then there's this update, and I thought that this was going to be a whole different set. I really thought everything was going to be different about this segment. I thought the book was going to be different, and the segment was going to be different. Hmm. So there's an update, and it says that Jane believes that she knows her attacker's identity. Evidence points to a war veteran who later killed himself and his family. And that's that's the update. (laughs) Thanks, UM. Yeah. That's all we need. That's good. Let's move on. Well, and I mean, they hinted at this person, you know, they showed some other victims, but they didn't really get into the other victims. And Mm -hmm. there, I mean, there's only so much they can do, but yeah, it was just a strange angle. So like I said, I read this book in the shadow of death and it really does focus on John Philippin. It talks about some suspects, but I guess it was written before these other suspects came to light. And the good part is it does give a little bit more information about the victims, which is important. But it really is about Philippin and how he became a profiler and the other cases that he worked on. They talk about how um, he had to take a break for a little while because he sort of was getting a little too much into thinking like a serial killer. It was kind of Oof. starting to damage. Yeah, even just hearing him talk about that, yeah, I was like, while I right. totally can appreciate your... The intent and your method, that's, ooh, yeah. a yeah. little. It made me uncomfortable. Yeah. He is also very eccentric. Mm-hmm. Yes, very eccentric presence. The book was good, but for my purposes for this segment, I had to do what I didn't want to do for a case like this, which is to go to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> An interstate killer from decades ago who has never been caught is the worst sort of thing to have to research <sighs> on the yeah. internet. <laughs> So I'm going to give a bit more information about the victims and then cover some suspects and then go into like a little bit internet sleuthing, but Mm -hmm. not too much. Because, yeah. (laughs) Because I'm (laughs) only one person. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So the definite victims that people believe are absolutely connected because there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not all of the people who were murdered and went missing in the area around that time are connected. It is, it's, it's alarming. I guess I haven't covered a serial killer before, but the amount Mm. of women and teenage girls who just went missing Mm. and were never seen again and were later discovered dead or just were never discovered is alarming. Horrible. The fact that the internet can't decide whether this person had six victims or 16 victims is 
terrible. Mm, that means that that's how many people went missing just in that window of time. Yeah, totally. It's terrifying. It's so scary. So on October 24th, 1978, at around 5.30 p.m., 27-year-old Kathy Milliken was at the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve on Route 11 in New London, New Hampshire. She was taking pictures for the New Hampshire chapter of the Audubon Society. She failed to return home that night. Ugh. The next day, only yards away from where she was last seen, her body was found sprawled out. Mm. She had been stabbed a total of 29 times in her throat and abdomen. Mm. Her belongings were scattered on the trail, and her car, still parked by the state highway, was undisturbed. On July 25, 1981, 37-year-old Mary Elizabeth Critchley was taking classes at the University of Vermont and planned on hitchhiking to Waterbury, Vermont, where she lived with a friend. She was last seen alive on July 25, 1981, near exit 13 of the Massachusetts Turnpike in Framingham, Massachusetts. Her body was found August 9, 1981, in a wooded area off of Unity Stage Road in Unity. The only thing missing were her sandals and knapsack. Initially, the medical examiner was unable to determine the cause of Mary's death because of the condition of her body, but later examination showed cut marks on the bones. Mm. 16-year-old nurse's aide, Bernice Cordemanche, was last seen by her boyfriend's mother in Claremont, New Hampshire on May 30, 1984. She was thought to have set out to see her boyfriend in Newport by hitchhiking along New Hampshire Route 12. She did not reach her destination and was subsequently reported missing. In April of 1986, a fisherman happened upon Cordermanche's remains. Forensic examination uncovered evidence of knife wounds to the neck and an injury to the head. On July 20th, 1984, 27-year-old Ellen Fried, who was a supervising nurse at Valley Regional Hospital, made a late-night stop to use a payphone in Claremont. Fried spoke with her sister for approximately an hour. An hour on a on payphone. payphone. <laughs> mm-hmm. When she suddenly remarked on a strange car that she'd observed driving back and forth in the vicinity. She stepped away from the phone briefly to make sure her car's engine would start and then returned. After speaking for a few minutes longer, Fried concluded the call. The next day, Fried failed to report to work and her car was found abandoned on Jarvis Road, a few miles away from the market where she used the payphone. Fried's remains were found in a wooded area near the banks of the Sugar River in Kellyville in September the following year. Postmortem examination revealed evidence of multiple stab wounds and probable sexual assault. And I'm sorry, where was her car? Was it still there by the payphone? It says her car was found abandoned on Jarvis Road. Okay, so what the heck? A few miles away from the market where she used Mm. the payphone. Ava Morse was a 27-year-old single mother of a 10-year-old daughter. In the morning of July 10th, 1985, 27-year-old Ava was last seen hitchhiking on Route 12 in North Charlestown, New Hampshire. It was 7 a.m. She had told her co-workers that she was going home sick, but before she left, she made a quick phone call. Later, a co-worker of Ava's told police that she said that she was going to visit an ex-girlfriend. A motorist reported that he gave her a lift to the Charlestown-Claremont line. This is the last time anyone would see Morse alive. And she, too, Mm. was reported missing. In 1986, Morris's remains were found by loggers about 500 feet from where Critchley's body had been discovered in 1981. Postmortem examination found evidence of knife wounds to Morris's neck. On April 15, 1986, 36-year-old Linda Moore was home alone doing yard work in Saxton's River, Vermont. That evening, her husband returned home to find his wife's dead body in their kitchen. She had more than two dozen stab wounds to her throat and abdomen. Linda also had defensive wounds on her hands and arms. By looking at the crime scene, it was obvious that Linda had fought her attacker. In 1987, police issued a composite sketch of a man thought to be connected to the stabbing death. The sketch showed a clean-shaven white male with a round face, dark-rimmed glasses, and dark-trimmed hair. Police thought the man to be 20 to 25 years old, slightly stocky, and carrying a bright blue knapsack on the day of the murder. At the time, police said that a man matching that description was spotted near the Moore home the day of the murder and may have been hitchhiking. Police have also said that the same description came from more than one source, and we'll post a photo of it. On January 10, 1987, 38-year-old nurse Barbara Agnew was returning from a skiing outing with friends in Stratton, Vermont. That evening, a snowplow driver encountered her green BMW at a northbound I-91 rest stop in Hartford, Vermont. 
The car was backed up against a snowbank. The door was open, butted against the bank, and there was blood on the steering wheel. Along with the fact that the door had been open long enough to have small snowbanks inside the car, the position of the car gave detectives an idea as to what could have happened. For some unknown reason, Agnew pulled into the Hartford I-91 northbound rest area, maybe to clean the windshield because the snow was very heavy at that point, maybe to pee because she'd been on the road for a while, but she was only about 10 minutes away from home, so they don't know why she would have stopped. At any rate, she was approached by a stranger. He shows her a knife, and he orders Agnew to go with him. At some point, Agnew flees back to her car, but the attacker follows her, stabs her, mm. But then something happens, and there's a moment for her to get away. Mm. So Agnew throws her car into reverse out of panic and hits the gas. If she had put the car into drive, she may have gotten away. (sighs) But the car backs up quickly, and she slams into a snowbank. No. Mm. No. She gets stuck in the snowbank, but worse than that, she can't close her door because in her panic, she left it open. So while she's backing up, the door is dragging in the snow. It's lodged. It's it's stuck in the snow. That is like a a scene out of Fargo. That is horrifying. It's a horror movie. It really is. Like, you think you're going to be okay. So the car gets stuck. The door is stuck because it sort of acted like a plow itself. So she can't can't close the door. She's, She's stuck. So they theorize that the man caught up to her and then took her away. On March 28, 1987, Agnew's body was found near an apple tree in Heartland, Vermont. The ski pass from the mountain that she had visited the last day she was seen alive hung from her jacket. She had been stabbed to death. And like I said, the reason for her pulling into the rest stop have continued to puzzle investigators. She also had stab wounds to the neck, which were inflicted from behind, which is something that a lot of the murders have in common, and then Mm. also repeated stab wounds to the lower abdomen. Mm. Okay. And then as we saw in the reenactment, late in the evening on August 6th, 1988, 22-year-old Jane Borowski, seven months pregnant, was returning from a county fair in Keene, New Hampshire, when she stopped at a closed convenience store in West Swansea to purchase soda from a vending machine. Borowski had returned to her car when she took notice of a Jeep Wagoneer parked next to her. Through her rearview mirror, Borowski then saw the driver of the vehicle walking around the back of her vehicle. He approached the vehicle and asked if the phone was working. Before she could say she didn't know, he grabbed her and brandished a knife, saying, quote, get out of the car or I'll cut you. Mm. Like we saw in the reenactment, Jane struggled with the attacker, and finally he accused her of attacking his girlfriend. In the book that I read, Jane said that it wasn't her and that her plate was from New Hampshire. And then she said that the man actually walked over to her car to look at the plates. And Jane described him as looking confused. What? This is bananas to me, but, you know, I've never been in that situation. She says that something came over her and she started yelling at him because her windshield was broken, because she had kicked the windshield in the scuffle. So he walks over to look at the plate and Jane starts screaming, what about my windshield? What about my windshield? So in a second, he's back on her Uh, Um, and he says to her, come on, you're coming with me. But just then headlights Mm. appeared on the highway. So he gets distracted. She runs again. But again, in a few seconds, he's on top of her. She feels him stabbing her. And as she convinced herself that this is it, it's over, that she's going to die, the guy's off of her Mm. and gone. Oh, my God. So it takes her a minute to collect herself. And like we saw in the segment, the man gets into the car and drives away. And he makes eye contact with her, watching her struggle to pull herself up and move. And then... Truly, she gets into the car and begins to drive and pulls up right behind him. So, like I said, Jane had been stabbed 19 times in her neck and abdomen. They had to remove part of her liver and both of her lungs collapsed. Her kneecap was shattered and the attacker had sliced through a tendon in her right thumb. So detectives were amazed that she was even able to start the car with her hand. Oh, wow. Let alone drive two miles bleeding out. Pregnant. Oh yes. And Jane Borowski's baby did survive, but UM makes it sound like everything was peachy. Right. It wasn't without complications. Her daughter would later be diagnosed with mild cerebral palsy and deal with oh. neurological and health complications for the rest of her life. Oh, oh no. Yeah. 
So those are the known victims. And then there are some possible victims that the jury's still out, essentially. So 16-year-old Heidi Martin was reported missing on May 20th, 1984, after she failed to return home from a jog. Her body was found on May 21st, 1984, in a brook off of a logging road. An investigation confirmed that she was the victim of a homicide. The case remains unsolved. Joanne Dunham, 14, was sexually assaulted and strangled on June 11, 1968 in Charleston, New Hampshire, and has been linked to the killings on the basis of geographic proximity. Mm -hmm. On October 5, 1982, 76-year-old Sylvia Gray was found bludgeoned and stabbed to death in a wooded area a few hundred yards from her home in Plainfield, New Hampshire, a day after having been reported missing. 38-year-old Stephen Hill was last seen mm -hmm. on June 20th, 1986, retrieving his paycheck from his Lebanon, New Hampshire employer. On July 15th, Hill's body was found with multiple stab wounds in Heartland, across the Connecticut River, from where Gray's body had been found four years earlier. On June 24th, 1988, decomposed body parts consisting of arms and legs belonging to a woman were found dumped along Massachusetts Route 78 in Warwick, Massachusetts, less than a mile from the New Hampshire border. The entire body was believed to have been dismembered. The head and torso were never found and are believed to have been disposed of elsewhere. Investigators ruled the death a homicide. The victim was described as white, average height with athletic type body. The woman's identity is still unknown and the homicide remains unsolved. Sarah Hunter, 36. You see what I'm saying here? Even if it yeah. isn't the same killer, this is a lot of people. This yeah. is alarming, yeah. yes. Sarah Hunter, 36, was employed as a golf pro in Manchester Center, Vermont. On September 19, 1986, her car was discovered parked at a gas station off of Route 7A and she was subsequently reported missing. Two months later, her remains were stumbled upon in a brush at the edge of a cornfield in Paulette, Vermont. She had been strangled. Police linked David Allen Morrison to Sarah's murder using DNA evidence, and prosecutors felt they had enough evidence to charge him. In 2014, he was charged with her murder. Forensic evidence, police said, showed strands of hair in his car were that of Sarah's. However, on February 13th, 2015, it was announced that it was discovered that the hair from Sarah that was thought to have been found in Morrison's car and sent to the FBI lab for analysis were actually found in her car. Due to this error, the charges were dismissed against Morrison. Ugh. Mm. And some believe Sarah Hunter's death is connected to the Connecticut River Valley killer. Mm. And then finally, on July 25th, 1989, 14-year-old Carrie Moss of New Boston, New Hampshire, left her parents' home to visit friends in Goffstown and disappeared. Almost exactly two years later, on July 24th, 1991, her skeletal remains were found in a wooded area in New Boston. While her cause of death could not be determined, she was thought to be the victim of a homicide. So there are similarities between most of these cases. So all of the cases, the known victims, not the suspected mm -hmm, right. victims. So in all of these cases, except for Critchley's, they all involved a knife attack. Four of the cases had specific stabbing patterns across the upper body and abdomen. Mm. The other cases may have also displayed this pattern but were too decomposed to tell. With the exception of Linda Moore and Jane Borowski, all of the victims were killed in a wooded area that they had been transported to. Both the Borowski and Moore attacks were thought to be interrupted. Two sets of victims were found in very close proximity to each other. Three of the victims were known to be hitchhiking. Two of the attacks, Fried and Borowski, definitely involved a payphone and were near a soda machine. It is possible mm. that this was also an element in the Agnew, Morse, Critchley, and Quartamanch cases. John Philippin once speculated it was possible the killer serviced these machines. Oh, it may yeah. be that the killer was simply choosing to look for women near places where he knew they'd be vulnerable. Hmm. And then there was a lot of speculation that was centered around the possibility that the killer was targeting healthcare workers because Fried and Agnew were nurses and Cordemanche was a nurse's aide. However, this theory, while prevalent, is believed to be unlikely by many in law enforcement. So let's get into the possible suspects. 
there are two categories of suspects in this case, the individuals that the locals believe did it, and then the theories put forth by interstate law enforcement officers and web sleuths. So I'm going to start with the locals, and I'm going to use initials, as none of them have ever been charged in this crime. Although there's record of them in the book that I read, when people talk about them online, they don't use their names, so. Okay. The first person is R.B., R.B. was a bit of an odd man. He stood in front of his home in a Speedo waving to women. Okay. okay. He was investigated for sexually harassing women at a local YMCA. He would write harassing letters to women and lived less than a mile from the place where Ellen Fried's remains were found. R.B. also had an invisible friend that he would speak to in public and fight with, Mm. and he had a tendency to stand in front of his neighbor's houses for long periods of time staring into their windows. Mm. He was never charged with any crimes related to the Connecticut River Valley killer, but I've seen on a lot of message boards that locals believe that it could have been him. I've also seen people who have met him and know him say that they think that he just has some mental health issues, but that he isn't a violent person. Yeah, that's almost what it sounds like to me. Like, he seems so unwell that it would be hard to execute all of these without getting caught. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, And then another local suspect going by HB was mentioned by many locals on the tip line that the New Hampshire State Police had set up. He was apparently, he, I believe he's still alive, is apparently a very large, very intimidating person. Person called in and gave HB's description for the murder of Linda Moore. He was known to drive I-91 seeking out women stuck on the side of the road to, quote, offer assistance. Mm. Um, Multiple women said that HB picked them up after their cars broke down and tried to have sex with them, and he was eventually convicted of rape. He fit the profile that John Philippin had created. Um, He was from an abusive home. He had a record of sexual-related incidents. He was someone familiar with the area and at ease in the backwoods, and he was known for spending long hours in his vehicle, quote, cruising the area. H.B. also admitted to being out in the storm the night of Agnew's murder, offering roadside assistance, but he said that he didn't see her. Law enforcement officials have never pressed charges, but he's mentioned frequently on the message boards by locals, and everyone says that the people from the area are afraid of him. Hmm. And then these are the suspects that kind of branch out a little bit broader and that the the web sleuths are are very into. So the first one is Delbert Tallman. And as I mentioned before, on May 20th, 1984, 16-year-old Heidi Martin went out for a jog in Heartland, Vermont, on Martinsville Road. The next day, her body was found in a swampy area behind Heartland Elementary School. She had been raped and stabbed to death. 21-year-old Delbert C. Tallman confessed to the crime and was tried. However, he later recanted his confession and was acquitted. (sighs) Nearly three years later, Barbara Agnew's body would be found approximately a mile from where Martin was discovered. Tallman had resided in Bellows Falls, Springfield, and Windsor, Vermont, as well as Claremont, New Hampshire, the locus of most of the Connecticut River Valley killings. He was convicted in 1996 on two counts of lewd and lascivious conduct with a child and is currently serving time in a Lake County, Florida prison for failure to comply with sex offender registration requirements. Given the circumstances of Martin's murder and the dearth of information related to the arrest and trial of a suspect, some web sleuths cite Martin's death as unsolved and part of the Connecticut River Valley killings. However, although the Fandom.com page says that Tallman is a suspect, over on Murderpedia, there is a statement at the end of the passage in big, bold, block letters that reads, Delbert Tallman has never been a suspect in the Connecticut River Valley (laughs) serial murders. Delbert Tallman is a convicted child molester. There is no evidence of any of the Connecticut River Valley victims being raped. Delbert Tallman would have been 25 years old in 1988 when Jane Borowski was attacked. She did hand-to-hand combat with her attacker and stated his age at between 35 and 40 years old. So somebody on Murderpedia is not having it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I was like, whoa, okay. I guess it wasn't Delbert. Um, The second suspect is a man named Gary Westover. So in October of 1997, 46-year-old Grafton, New Hampshire paraplegic named Gary Westover told his uncle, retired Grafton County Sheriff's Deputy Howard Minnan, that he had a confession. Westover had been paralyzed in a driving accident, leaving him with partial use of one arm. 
He lived his adult life in a wheelchair, collecting disability checks and peddling drugs on the side. Fall of 1997, Westover felt as if he wasn't going to make it until winter. The 46-year-old man said he was dying. He called his uncle, the person he trusted the most, and he said he needed to confess. Quote, I'm going to hell, Westover said. I've got to tell you something, Uncle Howard. Westover told Minnan that in 1987, three buddies picked him up for what was described as a night of partying. Allegedly, they loaded Westover and his wheelchair into their van and set out to Vermont, where they abducted, murdered, and dumped Barbara mm. Agnew. Mm. Apparently, Westover wrote the names of the three men on a scrap of paper. He gave it to Minnan, and then Minnan called the authorities. What? Minnan gave the authorities this information, and they ignored him. They didn't do anything with the information, and Minnan felt that it was laziness, that they didn't want to admit that it was an unsolved murder, and that they didn't want to deal with it. Apparently, he told his wife, Lois Minnan, that he would, quote, never take anything to law enforcement again. Oof. Apparently, in August of 2006, one of Westover's aunts wrote to Anne Agnew, sister of Barbara Agnew, with the information originally given by Westover to Minnan. I thought that this was really interesting because one problem the police had in solving Barbara Agnew's murder was that they couldn't figure out why she would pull into a rest area during a snowstorm when she was just 10 miles away from her home. Mm -hmm. And if she had been trying to clear ice from her windshield, why would she park in this dark area away from the street lamps? If she was going to use the bathroom, why wouldn't she wait 10 more minutes? Mm -hmm. If she was forced off the road, why wasn't there evidence in the snow? But... Gary Westover, his confession helped answer this question because maybe Westover was the bait. One thing Barbara Agnew's friends and family agreed oh upon my God. was that she had a heart for helping, no. and that's why she uh -huh. was a nurse. So oh. could she have pulled over to help a paralyzed man who was stuck in the snow? Oh, my God. Oh, mm, my God. Uh, I would. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> I thought that was a good theory. And apparently before Sheriff Minnan died in 2006, he was in a New Hampshire hospital reading the newspaper when he saw a story about a man named Michael Nicolau. He was named as a suspect in the Connecticut River Valley murders. He read about the information brought to authorities by private investigator Lynn Marie Cardi. And he read what Jane Borowski had to say about Nicolau. Upon reading all of this in his local paper, he became very upset he showed the story to his family and told his family, see this? This is Gary's story. This is what I tried to tell the state police. Gary told me when I called them to the house, but they treated me like a fool. I've wasted my whole life in law enforcement. They did nothing about what I told them, and this guy killed more people. So his family, again, tried to encourage him to contact the private investigator, and he said that he wouldn't unless he found that piece of paper with the names on it for proof. He said that New Hampshire State Police Officer William McGee was one of the officers who was in his living room that day that he gave the list of the three names in October of 1997. So I'm not even going to get into it, but there's a whole bunch of stuff about McGee online. I guess he is accused of some corruption. Locals don't really have many good things to say about him. I don't know if it's true and he's been convicted of anything or if it's just speculation. And, you know, people always think it's a cover-up. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a cover-up. I think it's just ineptitude. Yeah, so the last suspect is a man named Michael Nicolau who was referenced in the update of the segment. Mm -hmm. So we don't fully know Michael Nicolau's connection to Gary Westover. Apparently... When this private investigator, Cardi, mentioned Nicolau's name to Gary Westover's aunt, she said that the name sounded familiar. Um, this private investigator believes that authorities have that list of the three people, and she believes that Nicolau's name is on that list. Hmm. She believes that Westover may have become acquainted with Nicolau at a local VA hospital, but none of this has been confirmed, and Westover died in 1998. So there may or may not be a connection to Westover and Nicolau, but this is the story of Michael Nicolau. So on New Year's Eve 2005, Michael Nicolau, 56, killed his wife Aileen Nicolau and fatally wounded his stepdaughter, 20-year-old Taryn Bauman, before shooting himself in the mouth. Oh. Michael showed up at Aileen's father's house carrying a 30 caliber M1 carbine rifle and a semi-automatic pistol concealed in a guitar case. 
Aileen took him into a back bedroom to talk, and Taryn followed. Aileen's sister, Audrey Leon, called the police. She said that she had heard a lot of yelling and feared for her sister's safety. Hmm. Two officers met Leon in her driveway and went inside the home. When an officer tried to walk through a partly opened bedroom door, he was met by Michael Nicolau, who pointed a long-barreled weapon at him. Then the door slammed shut. With police surrounding the house after receiving a 911 call, Nicolau shot Aileen and shot 20-year-old Taryn and then himself. Mm. Five years earlier, in 2000, a St. Petersburg, Florida private investigator named Lynn Marie Cardi was hired by a Vermont mother to find her daughter, Michelle Ashley, who had had two babies with Michael Nicolau before she disappeared in 1988. Oh, oh my no. God. Rose Young had begged Massachusetts police for help, but they never found Michelle. The mother suspected Nicolau based on something her daughter had once said. Quote, if I'm ever missing, he killed me, and you need to track him down and find my kids. <sighs> it took Lynn Marie Cardi 15 minutes at the computer in 2001, which is pretty impressive, to track down a phone number for Michael Nicolau. She called him. He said, how did you find me? Cardi asked about Michelle, and Michael denied knowing her, but Cardi pressed on. He finally called her a slut. He said that she was doing drugs and that she ran off and abandoned the children. Cardi asked about the children, Nick and Joy. Michael said that he had them and that they were fine. The conversation was short, and when Cardi called back the next day, Nicolau's phone was disconnected. Now, years later, after Cardi first read of Nicolau's rampage, he was back on Cardi's radar. With Michelle in mind, she punched words into Google. New England, 1988, murder. She clicked on the story of a pregnant New Hampshire woman who was the sole survivor of a series of attacks known as the Connecticut River Valley Murders. She learned about the remains of at least six other young women who had been dumped beside back roads along I-91 in a stretch that straddled Vermont and New Hampshire. She noticed right away that several of the victims were nurses. She remembered hearing that Nicolau's first wife was a nurse and that his mother worked at a hospital. Hmm. She also read that the killer knew the area. Michelle's family lived in the heart of the Connecticut River Valley. One woman's body was found near her town, and Claremont, New Hampshire, the setting, of, the setting for several of the slayings, was between there and Holyoke, just off I-91. The killer used a martial arts grip on the surviving woman, and Nicolau had a black belt in karate. Mm. What Cardi found most curious was that the last attack was only four months before Michelle and Michael disappeared from the area. Cardi tracked down a phone number for Susan Nicolau, the nurse that Michael Nicolau married in 1978 before he hooked up with Michelle. The two divorced in 1982, a year after the first Valley victim. Cardi only spoke to Susan Nicolau once, and she refused to speak to her again. Susan said that she wouldn't talk about him and that she was terrified of him. Michael Nicolau had told his wife Aileen that his mother had molested him when he was young. However, when Cardi spoke to Nicolau's mother, she said that Nicolau was never sexually abused, but that her husband had hit him. Apparently, Nicolau's birth father, Edward Stratford, is a registered sex offender in South Carolina. And his mother divorced Stratford on, on grounds of extreme cruelty when Nicolau was just three years old. And she told the Times that Stratford was a child molester. So... Um, that kind of speaks to Philpin's profile of an abusive home. Right. Michael Nicolau enlisted in the Army in 1968, and in May 1971, the government charged Nicolau and seven other helicopter crewmen with murder for strafing innocent civilians while on a flight in the Mekong Delta the year before. Mm. Strafing is when you're in an aircraft, a military aircraft, and you have a machine gun or something equal to that, and you just spray bullets everywhere. Oh. Yeah. The military dropped the charges because of insufficient evidence, but days after the charges were dropped, Michael Nicolau was released from active duty. By 1977, Nicolau was living on and off in Virginia. Police in Charlottesville busted him for dealing drugs, and they used him as an informant. In 1983, he opened a porn shop called The Pleasure Chest in Charlottesville. However, in Lynn Marie Cardi's mind, Nicolau's time in Virginia was no alibi because, by all accounts, Nicolau had plenty of reasons to drive north. He was in Vermont over Christmas most of the years. His ex-wife Susan lived in Connecticut, and he was back and forth with Michelle's family. 
Apparently, Michelle left behind a bunch of baby books that she sort of used as journals. And that's what Cardi uses to piece together timelines and get information. She found all of these mm. abandoned baby books, which is hmm. heartbreaking. Cardi found a note in Michelle's one of Michelle's abandoned baby books that placed her and Nicolau in Hanover, New Hampshire, in a hospital on Thanksgiving of 1986. A nurse from that same hospital disappeared in January of 1987, a couple miles away from the Vermont home where Nicolau spent Christmas in the weeks that followed. Also, relatives remember that in the mid-1980s, Michael Nicolau drove a station wagon with wood-paneled sides. Mm. Jane Borowski had told police that her attacker drove a wood-paneled Jeep Wagoneer. Mm. Mm. I also read an article from the Brattleboro Reformer, and Cardi is quoted as saying, quote, you know the exact time that Jane Borowski was attacked, Michael Nicolau and Michelle Nicolau were fighting, and she had packed up the kids and ran away. He was driving up the same highway looking for her in Holderness, New Hampshire, in Turnbridge, Vermont, and then back in Massachusetts, he found her and convinced her to go back with him. In the baby books, they're back together on August 21st because they're celebrating their daughter's second birthday. John Philippin, the cr criminal profiler, believed that Nicolau was capable of committing the crime. Philippin said that he spoke to several people who served with Nicolau in Vietnam. Quote, some were peers, some were superior officers, and some of them liked him in the sense that they got along with him, trusted him as a pilot, and said that he was responsible. Quote, but they all pretty much had the same reaction to him, that this was a guy who brought baggage with him to Vietnam. He didn't learn it when he got to Vietnam, and the baggage was that he enjoyed killing. He liked mm. to kill, and it became an extracurricular activity for him. When he wasn't in a helicopter piloting around to shoot people, he'd go off and find other opportunities, Philippin said. Ooh. Chris Moore, the son of Linda Moore, who was found dead in her home in Westminster, Vermont, on April 15, 1986, believes that there are pros and cons to the Nicolau theory. Quote, Nicolau has dark skin and dark hair with a round face. This is not consistent with the composite sketch made with Jane's attack. However, it is consistent with the composite made of the man spotted in Linda's driveway at the time of her murder. Furthermore, Jane dismissed Nicolau as her attacker when she was shown multiple photos of him earlier in 2006. Jane is a sweet person who earnestly believes that she is right, but as the only witness to my mother's attacker, I hope she remains objective. Jane Borowski said it was a series of photos that gradually led her to identify Nicolau and that she had never been satisfied with the sketch drawn from her description. Chris Moore, who is a lawyer in Bellow Falls, Vermont, says, quote, There are huge gaps between the dots the investigator has asked us to connect, but there are no clear contradictions either. If this man were alive and standing trial today, he certainly would not be convicted on the evidence that I have seen. As far as the claim that Borowski and the rest of the victims were all attacked by the same person, that may be possible. However, there is no conclusive evidence that is the case, and another attacker or attackers cannot be ruled out yet. I like the fact that he's a lawyer, so he's very pragmatic about the evidence mm -hmm. that he's been presented. Right. Mm -hmm. So in 2007, New Hampshire cold case detectives stated they were in the process of examining surviving physical evidence, as well as Michael Nicolau's possible connection to the case. To date, no conclusions have been publicly announced, and Nicolau has never been conclusively linked to the crimes of the Connecticut River Valley killer. It's worth noting that Nicolau's candidacy as a suspect is hampered by the fact that he appears to have been living in Virginia at the time of the murders of Cordemanche, Fried, and Morse. Hmm. However, online sleuths have variously posited that Nicolau may also be the Colonial Parkway killer, the Route 29 stalker, the Blue Ridge Parkway rapist, and the murder of Julianne Williams and Lolly Williams in Shenandoah National Park. What? Yeah. And if you look at some of these, oh my God, wait until you see this guy. He looks like a dad. He looks mm. so average. It's wild. Mm. Um, so Jane Borowski has said that she's 100% sure that Michael Nicolau attacked her that day. And since that attack was confirmed to be part of the Connecticut River Valley killer spree, that must mean that Michael had to have been the killer. However, skeptics have said that since the attack was so dramatic and frightening to Borowski, that her mind could have just been trying to comfort her, so she wrongly identified Nicolau as her attacker. Though it is worth pointing out that the sketch of the perpetrator that attacked her was made before she knew who Nicolau was, and the sketch looks a little like Nicolau. I'm super bad at that. I would never be yeah, able to do that. Yeah, me too. 
So there's a Facebook page that's dedicated to finding uh, the Connecticut River Valley Killer, um, and Lynn Marie Cardi runs it. Wow. It, the whole thing is just evidence that it, the killer is Michael Nicolau. That one to me is so weird, though, if he's the one that attacked the pregnant woman, mm-hmm. Nicolau. Mm-hmm. Why and, – and he's the – serial killer why would he let her just drive to her friend's mm-hmm. house and not they were on like an abandoned road he could have pulled over again and realized she was alive like it put him in a lot of danger she saw his face i do not I if do he not is know. the serial killer i mean obviously he still got away with it if he is but that's so that seems out of i don't know norm for the rest of the killings yeah. to me Well, yeah, I'll get into it a little bit. There are people who think that Jane Borowski's case is not in any way related to the murders of the other women. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. She believes that he he fled because he saw headlights. Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're right. After do if he was doing all of these killings, that's what's gonna trip him up. He's not gonna make Mm -hmm. sure that she's dead. I'm I'm with you. I don't understand it. Yeah. So Lynn Marie Cardi posted I obviously read everything on that page so many comments she posted that it was confirmed that nicolau was in fact in new england in april of 1986 he arrived in massachusetts at his mother-in-law's house with his five-month pregnant wife seeking work in construction and restaurants during the time of linda moore's april 15th 1986 brutal murder it was also confirmed that nicolau was in new england in january of 1987 with his wife and child they were visiting his in-laws in Holderness, New Hampshire, at the time of the murder of Barbara Agnew in January of 1987. His in-laws lived on the opposite end of the street where Gary Westover's mother also lived. Nicolau's in-laws knew Gary Westover's mother. Additionally, documents placed Nicolau inside the New Hampshire hospital where Barbara Agnew worked on the same floor visiting his in-law on a prior trip from Virginia to New England six weeks before her murder. It has also been confirmed by his roommate, neighbors, and others that Michael Nicolau was in the business of buying, selling, and delivering large quantities of cocaine in Virginia and then driving it up and down the East Coast to New England for over a decade, including the time frame that the Connecticut River Valley murders occurred. He was also living in Chicopee, Massachusetts at the time of the stabbing attack of Jane Borowski, at which time he drove the identical Jeep Wagoneer described by Jane after her attack. A witness rode with him in the Jeep Wagoneer to work. She found his collection of bondage photos in a closet at a construction site that he was working in. Mm. The collection of pictures were taken over time. He was pictured in the bondage photos, sometimes with facial hair, other times without, sometimes with glasses, sometimes without, with many different women who appeared drugged and out of it. Oh, no. And then I had read a bunch of articles from around 2007 that spoke about getting Nicolau's DNA, comparing it to anything that was found at the scenes, and then entering his DNA into CODIS. And then I wasn't able to find anything else about it. So I I read this article, and the article said that the DNA profile of Nicolau had been entered into CODIS, but Cardi said that it was never entered. So she wrote, quote, his DNA has never been checked out or put into CODIS. In 2011, a court order for a Virginia state investigator to fly to Florida to pick up Nicolau's DNA and test it was issued. I arranged for his DNA to be picked up in Florida. Once the court order was attained and the DNA was brought on the airplane by a state of Virginia investigator, a block was put on it and it was not allowed to be entered into CODIS or tested for solving any of the cold cases. Both the state of Virginia investigator and his boss, the DA, had been very excited about using Nicolau's DNA to close lots of cold cases, but they were not allowed to complete their mission. So I don't know what happened, but I'm sure it's interstate jurisdictional Mm -hmm. bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. Because it always is. But apparently they got a court order to get this DNA and then a local DA or sheriff or somebody just shut it down and wouldn't give it. And that's it. That's like, that's all... I I mean, I reached out to Lynn Marie Cardi on Facebook to see if she had any updates, but that's 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. John Philippin theorized that the reason why we haven't heard anything is because there was nothing saved from the crime scenes, that it probably got destroyed, it was mismanaged, and that there is no (sighs) DNA. They probably didn't save anything. He believes that if they had, that we would have heard about it by now. I feel like, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been a decade. Come on. So many cases. The internet has so much to say, so I limited the comments. 
But I found a few that were interesting. So someone, and, and this is all from Reddit, someone who has since deleted their account said, quote, I used to live in Western Massachusetts, and the local rumor was that Michael Nicolau, a local dirtbag from Holyoke, Massachusetts, with a family who lived in the area of the murders, was the guy that did it. Holyoke is about two hours from where the murders took place, but it's a straight shot of Route 91, making it a fairly easy drive. It seems Nicolau would be familiar with the area as well. He lived in Virginia at the time of some of the murders, but locals say that he was always back in town for various reasons exactly when those murders occurred. A surviving mm -hmm. victim gave a description that matched Nicolau, and the car she described was very similar to the one he owned. Interestingly, some also link him to the Colonial Parkway killings, since he lived in Virginia where those took place as well. I don't know anything about the Colonial Parkway murders. I looked it up on yeah. Wikipedia, and apparently Wikipedia says, The Colonial Parkway murders were the slayings of at least eight people, uh, apparently by a serial killer along the Colonial Parkway in Virginia between 1986 and 1989. During that time, three couples were murdered, and one couple went missing and is presumed to be dead. The killer has not been identified. Hmm. Do we know by what method? Uh, I don't know. I haven't. I didn't look into it at all. Yeah. I can't imagine why, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> so this person does say, it is interesting to note that the last of the Connecticut River Valley killing scene bears at least passing similarity to the Colonial Parkway cases with the victim's vehicle abandoned in a rest area facing the opposite direction of their intended destination with the driver's window rolled down. This person goes on to say, Nicolau was an extremely violent man. He admitted to killing up to 30 civilians while serving in Vietnam and was prosecuted by the military, but the charges were dropped. His first wife disappeared. He ran over his second wife with his car, but she survived and moved to Florida. Nicolau then found her and shot and killed both her and her daughter before killing himself. So she had been run over by him before mm -hmm. that? Oh, my God. What the fuck? I read a whole article about oh, God. Aileen and her daughter. Uh. It was really sad. She kept trying to get away from him. He had two children with Michelle, and then Michelle disappeared. So she was raising his two children. They called her mom. And uh. basically, he he murdered their biological mom, and then he murdered their stepmom. And there's a whole crazy side story with Lynn Marie and Nick Nicolau, who is Michael Nicolau's son. They have their own side story. They've been on Tyra Banks' show and Dr. Phil about their mm. relationship through trying to figure out whether or not Michael Nicolau is this murderer. Whoa. I mean, it's a whole thing. A whole thing. So then another user named Pettibon Junction commented, quote, could some of them be unrelated? Absolutely. The only victims we can reasonably be certain that were killed by the same hand were the Claremont Three. The Claremont Three would be Bernice Countermanch, Ellen Fried, and Ava Morse. This person goes on to say, Linda Moore was almost definitely murdered by a local suspect, and I'm on the fence as to whether the earlier murder of Kathy Milliken is related to the Claremont Kellyville killings. Oh, locals also call it the, the Kellyville killings. They don't call it Connecticut River Valley killings. Okay. So this person goes on, ditto Barbara Agnew. The Gary Westover connection there is too hard to deny. Nicolau wasn't the killer. He lived in Virginia and was employed there at the time. All of the initial abductions occurred on weekdays during business hours. Further, he had no connection to any of the abduction or dump sites, which points to a local, and his vehicle doesn't match those witnesses saw the victims getting into. Also, the Jeep Wagoneer Borowski saw had New Hampshire plates, and Nicolau's cars would have been registered in Massachusetts or Virginia at the time. Mm-hmm. There is evidence that in the Agnew case and at least one of the Claremont homicides, Bernice Cordemanch, that there was more than one offender. There is also good reason to exclude Linda Moore from this killer's final tally as local police in Vermont have a good suspect for her murder. I'm comfortable linking Critchley, Cordemanch, Fried, and Morse, and tentatively linking Milliken as well. Agnew's a maybe, Moore's a no, and Borowski is likely something altogether different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then someone with the handle Downey's Detective replied and said, quote, I agree. I have never thought it was Michael Nicolau. I always thought it was just the private investigator trying to insert herself into a high profile case. I grew up where all this started and we locals have our own suspicions who it is. But the cops are afraid of him and even stated in the book Shadow of Death, the cops were scared when knocking on his door to question him. And that is the person that I mentioned who I use the initials HB, the really mm. big guy mm. 
-hmm. Apparently, when police went to question him, I think he threw like a car axle at them or something. (laughs) I thought you were going to say a car. (laughs) No, but like something equally as crazy and heavy. He was like super, super calm. And then all of a sudden, he apparently just freaked out and picked up this really heavy metal object. And the the police officer said he just threw it like it was nothing. Ew. Just to sort of show them how what he could do yeah. to them. Mm-hmm. And it seems like the locals are pretty convinced it's it's that guy. What the oh fuck? So like I said, a lot of the sleuths on the internet don't think that Borowski's case is connected. Uh, they cite the fact that she was left alive and that the killer didn't mm-hmm. try to take her to another location. Mm-hmm. But the same sleuths do admit that the perpetrator was likely Nikolau as he was in the area mm-hmm. and driving the same type of car that Borowski described. Yeah, that's what I think. But then I think he's not mm-hmm. whatever name, million names that this serial killer has. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. There is an argument to be made for Lynn Marie Cardi sort of like grabbing the spotlight, but she does do a lot of really good work. She has a right. private investigation agency in Florida. And she reunites a lot of people with their families. And she's also weirdly really involved in the Tommy Ziegler case. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that's in season nine of Unsolved Mysteries, his case. And it's been getting a lot of attention in the last Mm. decade or so. And she's really involved with that, too. So I don't know. I don't know if she's – I don't know if she's doing it to be in the spotlight. I think she just really – if anything, she has tunnel vision and really believes that this guy, Michael Nicolau, who she – has been involved with in one way or another since 2001. Yeah. She knows that he's a monster, and she's just kind of convinced that he did it. I mean, yeah, we've heard with so many huge cases where detectives for years thought it was a certain person, mm-hmm. and then it wasn't. So, yeah. like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> that's, that's all? It. <laughs> that's it. Just that little oh bit. Oh, my God, girl. I'm sorry I didn't solve it. <laughs> I mean. Very mad. Super upset. I did my best. Obviously, I took a lot away from researching all of this. But the main thing I took away is that there are a lot of women missing from so that time. scary. And horrible events. Oh, my God. And I know that hitchhiking had a lot to do with it and sort of like the expansiveness of the United States. I know that there's a lot of reasons why we had so many serial ki- – we have so many serial killers. But yeah. it's amazing that there are just dozens of women who went missing in this this area. Just the – I'm not talking yes. about the country. I'm just talking about the Connecticut Honey, River Valley. Most of the places you mentioned I have been to, which says a lot. Yeah. I don't go there often. Yeah, exactly. Well, New Hampshire is tiny. It's just such a small area. All the states that you mentioned, it's all close. Mm-hmm. And there's so many missing women. Ugh. I don't like it. It's horrendous. Oh, my gosh. Well, amazing job. Amazing I job. Believe. You, I can't even believe you pared that down to what you did, honestly. I, at some point, I just had to... Be finished. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. We are not a series I, of the Connecticut That was the other thing. Killers. You know, I looked into listening to a podcast about this, and there really aren't that many, and I can't figure out why. I'm surprised, yeah. And there's a lot of information out there. and s- Maybe because of the fact that it could potentially be so many different things. Yeah, or maybe the fact that so many people believe it is this guy that, right. I don't know. But I was really hmm. surprised. I thought that there would be a bunch of pod- – at least one episode podcasts about it. Yeah. But there really weren't. Wow. Yeah. So thanks <sighs> thanks for hanging in with me. You did it. Sorry, that was so you much information. I feel like it was word vomit did it. or whatever. Well, no, I mean, how great. can you not? How can you not? So, great job, Allison. Like we said at the top of this show, come back next week where we'll finish Season 4, Episode 4 with a Part 2. And I have a Wanted segment about Judge John Fairbanks. And a Lost Loves about Paul and Paula Scribner and their sister, Sue. Many of you know all the things to do, but if you don't, one of the things you can do right now is go to patreon.com slash resolve mysteries podcast and support us there. If you subscribe at the $5 a month level or higher, you'll get ad free episodes, two extra episodes a month and other goodies in the mail. 
Um, to see photos we reference in the episode, follow us on Instagram at Resolved Mysteries Podcast and on Facebook and Twitter at Resolve the Pod. You can contact us at resolvemysteriespodcast.com, resolvemysteriespodcast at gmail.com, or send us mail that we can hold in our hands at P.O. Box 14005, Portland, Oregon 97293. Along those lines, keep sending us your stories for listener short stack episodes so we can keep making them. We love to read what you write to us. It can really be anything as long as it's written in a way that's easy for us to read. And we'll be happy to read it. And last but not least, subscribe and rate and review. It really helps us out. For every review we receive, we're donating a dollar this month to an organization called Life After Hate. And we'll see you next week, honeys. See you next week. We love you. We love you so. We love you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. I'm Eliza. <laughs> I was yawning. I'm sorry. Oh I was yawning. I'm sorry. I'm Eliza.